when you first start learning about how to analyze a business and business costs, usually the textbook and professors, they're throwing so many different terms at you that it's very hard to understand what it is you're doing and what it is that you're supposed to be paying attention to. So in this video, I'm going to try to give an overview of why we want to look at costs, most of the things we want to be able to calculate, and how they're actually used all in one lecture. And it's covering a lot, I know. But I think by seeing not everything, but most things all together at once, it'll really help us in the long run whenever you're studying this kind of material. So I'm going to go through a simple example here. And in this example, we're going to talk about a fictitious, a make-believe business. And let's suppose that I have a business where what I do is I carve animals out of logs using a chainsaw. If you've never seen this, let me show you what this looks like. So here's a picture from Wikipedia of a person doing this activity. They have a big chainsaw, they have a big log, and they're carving some sort of animal sculpture out of it. Now this stuff is done a lot in the mountains of North Carolina, and let's just assume this is the business that we're talking about here. So let's talk about what kind of costs would be involved with this kind of business. So let's suppose that personally I have a helper. So this would be a laborer that I have helping me do this work. And I pay Jake per hour to help me cut logs and sweep up the sawdust and sharpen the chainsaw and things like that. Some other costs I have, I have the cost of rent of my shop, normal profit. Now this is an important one we need to pause on for a minute. Normal profit, if you remember when you're talking about the four factors of production that you need in order to produce anything. We talk about land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Usually we call payments to land rent. We call payments to labor wages. We call payments to capital interest. And we call payments to entrepreneurship profit. That's exactly what we're talking about here when we say normal profit. Normal profit is the amount that we have to pay the entrepreneur. Think about it as the wages of the entrepreneur. So this is the minimum amount of money that you have to pay the entrepreneur in order to keep them interested in keeping this business going. So let me say that again. Normal profit is the minimum amount that the entrepreneur needs to be able to pay him or herself. Otherwise, they're not interested in keeping this business going. Now, the strange thing about this is that to an economist, when we say minimum profit, when we say this normal profit, we say that this profit is a cost of doing business. And the first time most people hear that, it makes their head explode just a little bit. Because saying that profit is a cost, it just seems to go against all of our intuitions. But this amount of profit, not all the profit, but this amount of profit is a necessary expense that the business has to pay. Just like it has to pay for its land, it has to pay for its labor, it has to pay for its capital, a business must reward its entrepreneur with some level of profit. And we call that minimum level of profit. You have to pay the entrepreneur normal profit. Now, the term normal profit comes from the idea that this might be the average level of profit that an entrepreneur might expect, kind of the normal return to doing business in a business like this kind of what the entrepreneur expected to get, right? But it's not necessarily exactly that. It's just what is the minimum amount this entrepreneur has to pay themselves, otherwise they're going to shut this business down. And this is going to be different for everyone. A lot of this is going to depend on how much they enjoy doing what they're doing, right? Some people have businesses or activities that they do for free, and they work hard at these. So they might be a volunteer for a charity. Well, you do it because you love doing it, not because you want to get paid. 
But in most cases, this normal profit is going to be some amount that you have to make in order to compensate the entrepreneur for the worry, for the risk that they're taking, and the time they're spending just in managing this business. So getting back to the overview here, the cost of rent, the normal profit, and the implicit costs. Implicit costs might be the money we have tied up in tools. It might be the money you could earn from owning a different business with the money that you have invested in this business. So let's talk about implicit costs a little bit more here. And implicit costs, there are two, two ways we can def divide up costs here. Implicit or explicit. The word explicit means it is obvious, it is easily seen, it is not hidden in any way. Explicit. So when we have an explicit cost, an explicit cost is any cost where money changes hands. So money moves from one person to another or one organization to another. We can actually see the money moving. That's what makes it explicit. An implicit cost, on the other hand, it doesn't mean it's not a real cost, but it's a cost where no money actually changes hands. So money, no money moves. I'll use that as a shorthand way of saying no money is changing hands from one person to another. Let me give you a couple of good examples here. Explicit costs are going to probably be most costs of a business. If I have to pay rent for my land, that's going to be an explicit cost because I actually have to take some money or write a check and pay that. When I pay wages to my employees, that's an explicit cost. If I pay interest to the bank for a loan payment, that's an explicit cost. An implicit cost is going to be something where it really is a cost, but no money moves. A couple of good examples here might be, suppose I start a business, but in order to start a business, I have to quit my job. So this is a real cost because I'm really giving up that salary. But we don't call it an explicit cost because there's no money changing hands. I'm losing my paycheck that I used to get. So when we think about explicit costs, these are things that an accountant would normally see. We usually call these also accounting costs. Accountants, the job of an accountant is to track where the money moves, to make sure that the money is going where it should, and to make sure that no money ends up in the pockets of employees or anyone else where the money should not be ending up. So the main job of an accountant is to track moving money, to make sure that it's all accounted for. If I quit my job to start a business, and that means that I am no longer, so what I'm kind of what I'm losing is my old salary. Well, an accountant is not going to see the fact that I'm not earning that money anymore. And so it's something that's kind of invisible to them. They're not going to count it in the cost of doing business because no money actually changed hands. Now, one other good example of an implicit cost, and this is one that accountants do take account of in some ways, is depreciation. But accountants and economists think about depreciation in a different way. Depreciation means how much of a machine is wearing out over time. Now, to an economist, depreciation really means loss in value of using an asset the loss and value of an asset because you used it in the business. So for example, if I had a pickup truck that was worth $20,000 last year, and now, since I've used it for a year in my business, now it's worth $12,000 after I've used it, then that depreciation is clearly going to be $8,000. It's how much is the value of the truck gone down because I used the truck for a year in my business. An accountant does this in a different way. An accountant will usually use these rules called generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. And what an accountant will do is look up in a book. There will be a table there and it'll say, well, a truck is supposed to last five years and a 
computer is supposed to last two years, and they will just assume, based on these tables, that, well, if the value of the truck was $20,000, the book says this truck is supposed to last five years. So let's subtract one-fifth of the $20,000 away from the value of the truck, and that's what we're going to call the depreciation. This kind of depreciation to an economist, even though it's simple, that has its benefits. An economist wouldn't depreciate like this. We want to know really how much value in the truck has been lost by using it in the business for a year. That's really the cost. Now again, this is an implicit cost because when the value of the truck goes down, there's actually no money changing hands. It's not like this $8,000 is money that I'm paying to anyone. But nevertheless, it's a real cost. So don't think about implicit costs as not being real. Just like if I quit a job and I'm losing $50,000 in salary, that's every bit as real of a $50,000 cost as if I went out and spent $50,000. Okay? So implicit versus explicit. All right, let's finally get back to our example here. Now that we've talked about some of those details, the cost of rent and the normal profit and the implicit costs, let's assume that all those amounts of money are $50 per day. And those are costs that I incur whether or not I produce anything at all. That $50 per day is whether or not or not I produce anything. And we see that cost right here in this table. If I produce zero units, I still have $50 in total cost. And one more time, those total costs, that $50 there, is composed of things like rent, that normal profit, the amount of money I need to be making out of this business, otherwise I want to shut it down, that's part of that $50 there, and other implicit costs might be tied up in there as well. Now, when we actually carve these wooden chainsaw bears, we have to pay for more wood, more heat, more electricity. We have to pay Jake Moore, our helper. And there's also, the more time I spend in this business, the more time I have to spend away from relaxing or teaching or doing other things where I could be either making money or enjoying myself doing other activities. So when you produce more, there are more and more and more costs associated with that. Some of those costs are going to be explicit. More wood, more heat, more electricity, more labor. And some of those costs might be implicit. I take time away from relaxing. Or I take time away from doing other activities where I could make other money. Some of those implicit costs, some of those explicit costs. We want to learn how to fill out a table like this, where we start with two columns, the number of units produced and the total cost of producing them. And these total costs include all the costs, the implicit costs, the explicit costs, and including that normal profit we were talking about. How do we take just these first two columns and then break these costs into all these other kinds of costs that are going to tell us about different choices we need to make in this business? So let's get started. The first thing we want to do is to break our costs into two different kinds of costs. Fixed costs, which are costs that do not increase as you produce more units. A fixed cost, when we say it's fixed, it doesn't mean it couldn't change next week or next month. Fixed means today, as I produce more units, the fixed cost does not get higher. Variable costs are things that do cost us more when we produce more units. Which of these costs that we've been talking about are going to be fixed costs? The costs associated with producing zero units here, that $50, is our fixed cost. $50. Why? The reason is, if we're producing zero units, all of our costs must be fixed costs. None of them must be variable costs. Variable costs are things that increase as you produce more units. Well, if you're not producing any units, you can't have any variable costs, right? Variable costs are usually things like labor and materials. So here we were talking about wood, heat, electricity, labor, things like that. 
So when you're producing zero units, you have no variable costs. They must all be fixed costs. What if I decide to produce one of these chainsaw animals? My total costs go up to $150. How much are my fixed costs? Well, since fixed costs don't go up when you produce more units, the fixed costs must be 50 still because they don't increase as you produce more units. So the lesson here is that once you know how much your fixed costs are, that's what they always are, at least today, as you produce more units, always $50. So if we're breaking our costs into two pieces, fixed costs, variable costs, in order to get variable costs, we just want to subtract 150 minus 50 equals, well, we must have $100 in variable costs here. 160 minus 50, $110 in variable costs. These are our labor and materials costs, the things we use more of when we produce more. So 180 minus 50 is 130. 210 minus 50 is 160. And all of these things are in dollars or euros or whatever currency we're using here. $210, $270, $350, $400, and $450 being spent on labor and materials costs. Next kind of cost we want to be able to calculate and understand what it is, is a marginal cost. Well, we know from economics classes that the word marginal means additional or change in. So what we're asking is, what's the additional cost when I produce the first chainsaw animal, the second chainsaw animal, the third chainsaw animal. And we're not going to calculate this for zero. That's why we have this dashed line here. It doesn't make any sense to ask what's the additional cost for zero. But when we produce the first unit, our total cost goes from 50 to 150. So the change in cost, the additional cost, is $100. Now there's two ways to find marginal cost. You can either look at the change in the total cost or you can look at the change in the variable cost. They're always going to be changing by the same amount because the only difference between the total cost and the variable cost is the fixed cost and the fixed cost isn't ever changing. So the second unit costs $10 to make because our total costs go up by 10, variable costs go up by 10. They're always going to go up by the same amount, $10. The third unit costs us $20. The third unit costs us $30. Looking at 160 minus 130, 210 minus 160, well, that's $50. $60 for the sixth unit, $80 for the seventh unit, and $100 for the eighth unit. What the marginal cost tells us is when we decide to produce that one, that one unit, how much did that one cost? Well, if we produce the fifth unit and it causes our total cost to go up by 50, then we can say that that fifth unit, the fifth unit itself, cost us $50. So that's the interpretation there. Now let's calculate these last two columns, and then we'll see what we do with all of these things after we graph them and talk about the patterns a little bit. So average total cost, whenever you see the word average, this prefix average total cost or average variable cost, what we're saying is divide by quantity. So take that kind of cost and divide it by quantity. So average total cost is total cost divided by quantity. Average variable cost is variable cost divided by quantity. And what it gives us is that kind of cost per unit. Total cost per unit or variable cost per unit. Labor and materials cost per unit. So to get average total cost, we're just taking the total cost column and dividing it by the number produced column over here. Except we don't want to do it for zero, right? We don't want to divide 50 by zero. That's a no-no. So again, that's why we have this little dashed line over here. But for all the other ones, 
what's the average total cost when we produce one unit? 150 divided by one. Well, it's $150 each. $160 divided by two says they cost $80 each. Similarly for variable cost, we just want to look at the labor and materials cost per unit. We take those variable costs, 100, 110, 130, and divide them by the quantity we're producing. So 100 divided by 1 is $100 per unit spent on variable costs. 110 divided by 2, $55 per unit spent on variable costs. Take a minute and fill out the rest of your table. So what we should get here is 180 divided by 3 is 60. And then $52.50 when we're producing 4 units. Total cost per unit. $52, $53.33, and $57.14, and $62.50. Total cost per unit. Variable cost per unit. Again, here we're going back to $130 divided by 3, $43.33, $40, $42, and $45, $50, and $56.25. It's going to be very common to graph these last three columns, the marginal cost, the average total cost, and the average variable cost, because those are ones that really help us with deciding what we should do as a business. So let's graph these really quickly, starting with the marginal cost. I'll do in red here. So 100, 10, 20, 30, 50, $60 for the sixth unit. It costs $80 for the seventh unit, and it costs $100 to produce the eighth unit. And we just connect all those together. Marginal cost. So let's just keep track of how much each additional unit costs as we produce it. Now let's graph the average total cost. I'll do that in green. 150. 80. We're going to be approximate here for some of these where we can't see exactly where to put the dot, but we don't want to be too sloppy. 52.50 for 4, 52 for 5, 53.33 for 6, 57.14, and 62.50. And connect those dots. Average total costs. Now we'll do the same thing for average variable cost, and I'll use blue here for average variable cost. 100, 55, 60, 40, 55. and connect the dots. All right, now let's talk about the shapes and the patterns that we see in these graphs. First, marginal cost. And we can refer back to the table as, as we do it. Some people are more comfortable with tables. Some people are more comfortable with graphs. But when we look at marginal cost here, we see that marginal cost of the first unit is extremely high. So when we make that first one, it costs a lot of money. But then the second and the third one don't cost nearly as much. Why might that be? Well, one good reason is that in most businesses, most activities, in order to get started, you're going to have a lot of things you have to do just to get rolling. And if you just do one unit, all those costs of getting everything started are going to be wrapped up in that first unit. Let me give you an example. Suppose we were talking about producing cars. And we were talking about BMW. They have a factory where they make cars. And they call in all of their workers. They get the factory going. They put all the paint in the paint sprayers. They get the robots booted up. They get all the parts laid out. All the workers put on all their equipment. And then we make one 
car. One car rolls off the production line. And then we say, okay, everyone go home. How expensive is that first car going to be? That one car. Well, it's going to be extremely expensive because of all those startup costs of getting everything going are built into the additional cost of just producing that first unit. Now think about how cheap it would be to produce a second car after the first one. Well, the additional cost of producing the second car is going to be very low compared to the first one because we've already gotten everything ready. Everything's already going. To get one more unit rolling off the production line is going to be extremely cheap. So this is why we see this typical pattern where the marginal cost of the first unit, sometimes maybe the first couple of units, is very expensive. But then once we get rolling, the additional cost of the next few units is pretty low. So it's an important thing to recognize and understand that this usually happens. Now, the next thing about marginal cost that's important to understand is that in addition to the first one being really expensive and then it drops down really quickly, is that as we produce more units, we see that the marginal cost starts to get a little higher and a little higher and a little higher and a little higher. And why might that be? Well, there are a few reasons for this as well. Let's think about a few. One good reason is that as you produce more and more and more, people are working longer and longer hours. And as people work longer, they get more tired. They get slower. And if you have to pay people the same amount per hour to produce more units, when they start to get tired, it might take them two hours to produce another unit instead of one, un one more hour to produce another unit. Well, that's going to cost you more then if I pay you for two hours for one more unit instead of one hour for one more unit. So things are going to tend to cost more per unit, more additional money per unit as we produce more. Another reason is I might have to start paying you overtime in many countries, including the United States, as we produce more units and we keep you later and later and later through the day, at some point we have to start paying you 150% of your wages for additional hours. So that might be another reason why this marginal cost goes up as we produce more units. Additional reasons might be that you might have to call in more workers to share the same equipment in order to produce more. And if more workers, say you only have 10 shovels, and you call in 30 workers, and those 30 workers are having to share the shovels, or if workers are having to share computers, those additional workers aren't going to be as productive when they have to start sharing those resources in order to produce more units. So that's another reason why things might start costing more as you produ produce more units. Long story short, as you get to higher and higher levels of output, usually we see the marginal cost of those later units being higher than the marginal cost of the lower units, except for that first unit, as we talked about, which is usually pretty expensive due to those startup costs. Now, this marginal cost usually has this kind of checkmark shape to it. This is a typical pattern that we usually see. Now, average total cost and average variable cost, we usually describe those as having more of a U shape because they go down, they hit a minimum down here, and then they start to slowly go back up. So usually we'll call that a U-shaped average to total cost curve and also a U-shaped average variable cost curve. The big difference here being that the average variable cost curve is lower and the difference between the average total and the average variable cost curve, in other words, the average total cost is the total cost per unit, the average variable cost is the labor and materials cost per unit, the difference between those two curves, which gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, turns out to be the fixed cost per unit. Now, we didn't calculate fixed cost per unit here, but fixed cost per unit would be fixed cost divided by quantity. 
So we divide it by 1, we divide it by 2, we divide it by 3, and that fixed cost per unit is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as we produce more units, right? So those average total costs and average variable cost curves are going to get closer and closer and closer together as we produce more and more and more units out here. Finally, now that we have all of those things in the background kind of understood, what are fixed costs and variable costs and implicit costs and what's normal profit? And again, let me remind you that normal profit is included in this $50 of fixed costs here. What do we do with all this stuff? Well, we use this information in the table and in the graph to help us decide how many units we should produce given different market prices. So here's what we're talking about. We're assuming that these costs we're talking about are the costs for one business, one supplier out of many suppliers out there in the market. And there's a demand for what we're selling. And we are one of many suppliers out there in the marketplace. And let's assume to start off with that the market price is $71. What that means is that I can go to work, I can produce these chainsaw carved animals, and I can go to the market and I can sell as many of them as I want for $71, since I'm one small supplier out of many. So the equilibrium price is $71. Now here's what I want to know as one of these producers. How many of these chainsaw carved animals should I make today? Now here's the rule. And down at the bottom of the sheet, we want to write this rule down. What is the general rule for how many units you should produce, if you produce any at all, right? You have the choice not to produce anything we'll talk about in a minute. So the general rule about how many to produce, it says, ignore this downward sloping portion of the marginal cost curve here. Ignore that part. Why? Well, because the first unit, or maybe sometimes the first few units, are going to be so expensive because of those startup costs involved with that first unit, or first few units sometimes, okay? So we want to ignore the, the downward sloping part of the marginal cost curve, and we want to just start considering this part of the marginal cost curve where we've already gotten rolling, right? Where everything's going. That's what we want to focus on over there. So ignoring the downward sloping part, let's focus where the marginal cost curve bottoms out. That's right down here. And we start asking ourselves the question, if I can produce this second chainsaw animal at a cost of $10, that's the marginal cost, and then I can turn around and sell it for $71, does that sound like a good idea? To produce something that costs $10 and sell it for $71? Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So we want to produce the second chainsaw animal. What about the third? Well, the additional cost is $20. If I can produce something that costs $20 and sell it for $71, should I do it? Yes. Cost $21, sell it for $71. I'd love to do that all day if I could, but we can't. Because when we produce the fourth one, the marginal cost we saw in our table was $30. But still, do we want to produce it if it costs $30 and we can sell it for $71? Yes. So the rule basically says, and then we'll get to, to using it here, ignore the downward sloping part of the marginal cost curve. But then after that, keep producing all units and produce as long as marginal cost is less than or equal to the price that you can sell it for. Produce as long as the marginal cost is less than or equal to the price. So let's keep doing that here with our table and our graph and see when we should stop if the price is $71 a piece. And we decided we should produce the second one, the third one, the fourth one. What about the fifth one? 
Well, the fifth one costs 50. We can sell it for 71. Yes. The sixth one would cost us $60. If we can sell it for 71, yes. What about the seventh one? It'll cost us 80, and we could turn around and sell it for $71. No, we don't want to do that. So our answer is that we would want to stop here at producing six units. Because if we make the seventh one, it would cost us 80, and we could only turn around and sell it for $71. And that would be bad. We'd lose some money on doing that one. So how many should we make? Six. Now, how much profit would we earn if we made six? Well, here's the formula for profit. Total revenue minus total cost. Total revenue is price times quantity. If we're selling these units for $71 a piece times, we're making six of them, our total revenue is going to be $426. How much are our total costs? Well, we can look those up from the table. When we're producing six units, that's $320. So $426 minus $320 in total costs. The profit is going to be $106. So this was a good day. I want to remind you of one thing. When we say that you're earning $106 in profit, there's actually a little bit more in profit this entrepreneur would be making. And that little bit extra profit that that entrepreneur would be making is this normal profit that we were talking about here. All right, let me erase some of this highlighting so I can highlight it again. Normal profit. Maybe in this business for this person carving these chainsaw animals, this would be $25 per day. That's the minimum amount the entrepreneur needs to get paid to want to keep this business open. So if that's $25, when we say that this person is making $106 in profit, what we're really saying here is this is extra profit over and above, on top of that minimum amount they need to make. So this $106 is really all gravy. It's all bonus money that this entrepreneur is going to be overjoyed with. So when we say profit, we're already subtracting out a little bit of profit, that minimum amount the entrepreneur needs to be paid. So this $106 is what we call economic profit, which is extra profit over and above the minimum. Now let's ask kind of a silly question here. What if we decided today that we didn't want to go and do any of this. We didn't want to go produce any chainsaw animals, and we just wanted to stay in bed. How much would our profit be? Well, our total revenue, price times quantity, would be zero. But we have to subtract off our total costs. How much are our total costs if we produce zero units and we just stayed in bed? Oh, 50. 50. So if we decided to stay in bed, we wouldn't make zero profit. We would make zero minus $50. We would actually lose $50 there. Now, why am I bringing that up? Well, because that's always an option. And sometimes it might be the best option to stay in bed. In other words, instead of calling it staying in bed, the technical term we use for that is shutting down today and producing zero shutting down and produce Q equals zero. That's not our best choice in this case, obviously. Our best choice is to make this $106 in profit. Now let's move on to the next example. Suppose that due to foreign competition, now we can only sell as many as we want for a lower price, $51 each. Now what could have happened? Well, in our supply and demand graph here, when we have more competition, more people producing these chainsaw animals, that increases the supply. And that's driving the market price down to $51. Okay, well, how am I going to react if I am this entrepreneur who is selling these chainsaw animals? Let's use this rule. Ignore the downward sloping part of the marginal cost curve. Produce as long as the marginal cost is less than or equal to the price. So we ignore the downward sloping part. We start where the marginal cost bottoms out down here. 
and we say, should we produce the first chainsaw animal? Well, we kind of ignore that one, right? So we start at the second one. Should we produce the second one if the marginal cost is 10 and we can sell it for 51? Yes. Should we produce the third if it costs us 20 and we can sell it for 51? Yes. So when are we going to stop? Well, we basically look at the marginal cost table here and we see that we should stop at the fifth chainsaw animal because the sixth one would cost 60 and we're not going to produce something for 60 and turn around and sell it for $51. So our answer would be produce five units. How much profit are we going to earn if we do this? All right, well, we do total revenue minus total cost like before. Total revenue is going to be five times $51 equals $255 in total revenue. Minus our total cost up here is $260 for producing five units. And our profit is going to be negative $5. So we could say a loss of $5 or a profit of negative $5. We're not very happy. Now, what's really going on here? Well, when we say profit, we're really saying how much profit over and above the minimum necessary to keep the entrepreneur interested in running this business. And what we're saying here is it's $5 less. The amount of profit they're making is $5 less than what they need to make to keep this business running, to keep them interested in continuing this enterprise. But today, that's the best they can do is to lose $5 compared to what they wanted. Because what's their other option today, really? Since they have their rent they have to pay, they have their money tied up in their tools and all those things, their other option really is to stay in bed and produce zero, and in that case, they'd lose $50. So which would you rather do, lose $50 today or lose $5 today? Their best choice is to lose this $5 today. Now, they're not going to do that forever, but that's the best choice they could do today. In the long run, if they think they're always going to earn $5 less than what they need to keep them interested in staying in this business, in the long run, they're going to exit this industry altogether and do something else. Let's look at the third example here. Suppose now, in addition to the foreign competition, now all the tourists go home. And tourists are usually the people who buy these chainsaw carved animals. And now we can only sell these things for $33. What's going on in our supply and demand diagram? Well, when there are fewer people wanting to buy these things, the demand is going to decrease. And now the market price has fallen even further to $33. So now we have to decide what should we do. Well, let's follow our rule. And our rule says ignore the downward, slope of the downward sloping part of the marginal cost curve and produce as long as the marginal cost is less than or equal to price. So we start again with the second unit and say, well, if we can produce it for... $10 and sell it for $33? Sounds pretty good. If we can produce the third one, it'll cost us $20. Sell it for $33? Sure. Produce the fourth, cost us $30. Sell it for $33? Sure. But then we want to stop there. So we'd want to produce four units at that low price of $33. So how many should we make four units? How much profit are we going to earn? Well, let's do our total revenue minus total cost. Total revenue is 4 times $33 is going to be $132 total revenue. Our total cost, looking at our table, is $210. Our loss, $78. That's terrible. So we're going to lose... $78. But hey, wait a minute. We have another option. How much would I make if I just decided to stay 
in bed today. Hey, I would only lose $50 if I decided to shut down and produce zero. I'd have no revenue, but I'd still have that $50 in fixed costs. So what's our best choice in scenario C here? Well, our best choice is to stay in bed. Technically, what we would say is you would shut down and produce zero. Now, why is that? Well, there are a few ways to think about how to explain what's going on here in scenario three. Basically, the price has gotten so low that it's not worth it to produce anything. We do worse producing than by shutting down and producing zero. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about this is to go back to the idea of producer surplus. Producer surplus is what you get when you take total revenue minus variable costs. Let's look at what's going on in scenario C here. Total revenue is $132. When we subtract off the variable cost for producing four units, variable cost, variable costs are 160. That's negative $28. Hmm, this is bad, and this is what's going on here. The reason why we should shut down is if we call in our employees, let's just think about our variable costs as just being labor costs for a moment. If we produce four units and we call in our employees, we owe them $160 for producing the four units. When I go and sell those four units, I'm only going to bring in $132. Wow, by calling in my employees, I'm not going to have enough money if I take my entire revenue to be able to pay just for calling in my employees there. So that's why we shouldn't do it. So we have another rule here to think about, another rule. And this other rule is not just how much to produce. This rule is telling us whether or not we should produce anything at all. And let's write that rule two different ways. Now, one way to know that you shouldn't produce is if you're going to lose more money by producing than you would if you didn't produce. But two a little bit better ways to write this rule are the following. Number one, don't produce, shut down, if the total revenue that you get from producing your product is less than your variable costs. That's what we see here. Our total revenue, less than our variable costs, that's what's digging an even deeper hole, and that's why we should shut down and produce zero. There's another way to think about this, though, that's even easier once you see it. Total revenue is just price times quantity, right? And we know that variable costs are our labor and materials costs. Now, what do we get if we take both sides of this thing? We were saying if total revenue is less than variable costs, we should shut down. What do we get if we divide both sides of this by Q? Well, on the left-hand side, the Qs cancel, and we just get P, price. On the right-hand side, variable cost divided by quantity, we call that average variable cost. So a second way of writing this rule that turns out to be easier is shut down if price is less than average variable cost. Now let me give you a shortcut that we can use whenever we fill out a cost table to help us understand what's going on and what's going to happen when we do this analysis and we decide how many units to produce. Let me give you a shortcut. I always highlight two numbers in my cost table. When we look at average total cost, find the smallest number. Find the minimum average total cost. $52. That $52, whatever the minimum average total cost is, we call that the break-even price. The break-even price means if the price gets below 52, we're going to lose money. We're going to have a negative profit, in other words. 
If the price is above 52, we're going to have a profit. If the price is exactly $52, we're going to break even. Let's see how that works with the prices we were seeing before here. In example A, we had a market price of $71 and we made a profit. That price 71 is bigger than the break even price of 52. In the second example, we had a price of $51. Because that market price is $51, it's less than the break even price, we lost money. So, break even price. Do an example where the price is exactly 52 and you'll see the firm exactly breaks even. Now there's another thing we want to highlight and that's to look at the minimum of the average variable cost. The lowest number in the average variable cost here is $40. We have a name for that. The minimum average variable cost is what we call the shutdown price. Now, why do we call that $40 the shutdown price? Because if the price gets below $40, our best choice is going to be to shut down and produce zero units. Now, why is that? Why does that make sense? Well, because that's the lowest amount. That is the lowest possible amount that I could possibly pay my employees per unit if I call them in. If I tell them to stay home, I have to pay them zero, of course. But if I call in my employees, the lowest possible amount I have to pay them per unit I'm going to sell is $40. Now, if the price I'm selling my units for is less than 40 and I call my workers in, you see there's no way that I can break even doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to be worse off by calling my employees in than if I tell them to stay home here. So that's why that's the shutdown price. Now, as we saw down here, when, our, when the market price was 33, we did better by shutting down. And we're going to see the same story even if the market price was $39.99. We're going to do worse if we produce anything than if we shut down and produce zero. The shutdown rule here, this is what we call the second rule. The shutdown rule says shut down if price is less than the minimum average variable cost. That makes it an easier way to implement it. Just find the lowest amount average variable cost gets to. If the price is below that, guaranteed, best option, shut down and produce zero. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about in this lecture is the supply curve. How does my individual business supply curve for these wooden carvings, how does it relate to what we've talked about so far? Remember what our rule is for how many units to produce. Well, there's kind of two parts. The first part is the shutdown rule, right? Let's take that into account first. That says if the price is below 40, in this case, if the price is below 40, produce zero. All right, so here's $40. So anytime the price is below that $40, just shut down. And when we combine that with our other rule for how many to produce, which said, well, look at these individual units, and if the marginal cost is less than the price, produce it. Let's start at a high price. That's the easiest way to see this. What if the price was $100? How many units would we produce? Well, since the marginal cost is 100, if the price was 100, we'd be happy to produce 8 units, right? Keep producing as long as the price is greater than or equal to marginal cost. So if the price was $100, we'd be willing to make 8 units. What if the price fell to 90, 85, etc.? Well, we wouldn't be willing to produce 8 units anymore. As the price falls, we're not willing to produce 8 units anymore, but we'd still be willing to produce 7 as long as the price was at least $80. So at a price of 80, we're willing to produce 7 units. 
And as long as the price is $60 or more, we're willing to produce six units. So let's think about where a supply curve comes from then. We know that at a price, let's draw it over here. We know that at a price of $100, this business would be willing to produce eight. That's a point on their supply curve. We know that at a price of $80, they'd be willing to produce seven. That's another point on their supply curve for their individual firm. And at a price of $60, they'd be willing to produce six units. That's another point on this business's supply curve. So what are we really doing here? Well, what we're really doing is looking at the marginal cost curve and saying that's somehow related to this business's supply, the number of units they're willing to supply at each market price they might be willing to see. However, there's a point at which this business is not going to be willing to supply anything, and that's when the price gets below 40, that shutdown price there. So we would want to keep this supply curve for this business going down to $60. They'd produce six units at $50. They'd be willing to produce five units. But at $30, they're not willing to produce anything. They're not willing to produce four units because $30 is below the shutdown price of $40. So at least down to some point, at least down to $50, the supply curve keeps going down to five units. But we know the lowest possible point on this supply curve is going to be at a price of $40. Because below that, the firm would shut down. At a price of $40, how many units would this firm be willing to make? Well, we know they'd be willing to produce the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one. Because the marginal cost of the fourth one is only 30 If the market price was 40 they would be willing to produce it. So here's what the lowest point on the supply curve would look like. $40 and four units. And then the supply curve for this firm shoots over to zero units. And they're telling us that at a price of $39.99 or lower, they're not going to produce anything. Now that is an awful lot to cover in one video. What are implicit costs and explicit costs? What's a normal profit? What's a fixed cost, a variable cost, a marginal cost, an average total cost, and an average variable cost? And how do we use all those to help make business decisions about how much to produce and when and whether to shut down? That's a lot to cover. But if you understand most of what I just covered here, then you are going to understand most of what is covered in a chapter or even two in a book on costs and production and how to use these tables for business decisions. So if you have any questions or concerns or comments about this, please let me know. Otherwise, this is Dr. Berkey signing out, and I wish you the best luck with your economic studies.